for season two. Or no. is that in the post? Is that in the post? That's that's in the post for sure. <laughs> but we're li- we're live now, Johnson. Just as you started speaking, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but you always do it. Uh, <laughs> But hello, good evening everyone and welcome everybody to yet another episode of Why You So Extra, a epic talk show where we host change makers and explore um, what it takes to put the extra into the extraordinary. Um, more on this show, to, today we actually have a very special guest but um, maybe just give us some time to go over the show. Um, Why You So Extra was created for us to speak with various change makers that inspires us no matter big or small, in um, doing um, that little extra to make a difference in um, today's world. So in case you don't know yet, my name is Andrew and joined by me will be my co-host, uh, Johnson, who is also the one that spoke over um, me right at the start, but that's okay, all is forgiven. Uh, Johnson is the co-founder of Extraordinary People Impacting Communities, also as known as EPIC. What's good? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you why I, I, I spoke over clearly I am rusty uh, but <laughs> it's been a couple of months now I hope everyone's uh, excited to, to hear from us as well uh, but this is our second season we made it and this would be the first episode of the second season and the six episodes uh, in, in total and I'm, I'm so excited to do this together with you again uh, Andrew to, right. to, to host yet another extraordinary person Six, wow, our sixth episode, meaning our sixth guest, right, if I remember correctly. Um, when, when I think we started like late last year, and our, our previous episode was actually in November. Um, so it has been a quick minute, um, but we figured that this is now a, um, a good time again to bring this back. Um, I'm feeling not so nervous. Um, <laughs> if, if I may share, I think it's just... My internet has been quite bad recently, so I'm hoping that throughout the next hour, it'll stay, stay well, stay put, <laughs> and just cooperate with us. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, is there anything you'd like to share before we introduce our guests? No, not at all. I no, think no, really no. excited and very sorry for speaking over you, but I think let's uh, we should get started and, and warmed up again. All right, all right, that's fine. Um, well. I think it's it's made quite clear who our guest is going to be. His name is Justin, Justin Lee. Um, he's also basically by Commute KL. I met Justin probably two or three years back. Um, there's a funny, funny story to it, but we were stuck in Kelantan for a um, voluntary mission. Um, but back then when I met Justin, he, he was not really doing um, what he's doing now, which we'll touch on later. Um, so I think how I brought him on to the show was purely through the last two years of following him on social media, I believe. I noticed he's been first and foremost cycling a lot. But I think on top of that, what I saw was that he, so he cycles to grocery shop. And what really caught my attention was that he made it a very clear objective where he's not going to use any plastic or at least single-time use plastic. And you know how most common people would grocery shop, you you just get a plastic, put your fruits in, put your vegetables in, and when you go up to um, the weighing machine or the weighing scale and they give you the price tag, right? That's, that comes with a sticker. So I think what I saw Justin did was because he had no plastic bag, um, he used his arm as, um, as, his, as, as the form of getting those bills on him so his arm would be pasted with just all the price tags and i thought like wow this guy is pretty extra actually like he's <laughs> he's really going the extra mile um i don't know if he's embarrassed by it but i think it would definitely catch some people off guard line in some sense so that really sparked um the initial uh, reason behind why i wanted to bring him in but uh, on top of that, I believe it's through the pandemic where uh, Justin has been cycling a lot and he's been also educating the public about the potential of a bicycle. Um, but, 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 I think without further ado, I'll just let the man speak for himself. Uh, we're going to bring Justin in just 
in a moment. Hello, Justin. Can you hear us? Uh, and I'm here. Okay, hi, hey, hi Justin. everyone. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, I can hear you guys. Yeah, thanks Great. for your introduction and thanks for inviting me to uh, have this conversation with you guys. Um, and and also I've been part of a few epic uh, builds. Also part of an epic. Um, I think last time. Uh, epic design workshop or something like that for a few months and after that we eventually built a, a home at uh, Gomba. So yeah, uh, and after that, yeah, of course I met uh, Andrew through uh, 4x4 at Plankton and it's it's nice to meet everyone again, I guess. Uh, it's nice to meet everyone again and to talk about, yeah, this, uh, yeah, bike commit KL, yeah. Great. Yeah, I think for the sake of uh, the audience out there who may or may not know you yet, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself um, and also who and what Bike Commute <laughs> KL is. Um, yeah, whenever uh, whenever you're ready. <laughs> who, who, I, who am I? <laughs> uh, uh, so maybe, maybe a bit of what I do, like some of the things I do at the moment. So I'm a part-time... Uh, architectural uh, lecturer at UCSI University. I'm also a part-time uh, uh, architectural designer also, so I'm doing some of my own projects freelance at the moment. And, and, um, and now I'm also doing Bike Commute KL, which is something that I started uh, during the pandemic. I think that during the second the second part of the pandemic, I think the second lockdown of the pandemic, I started uh, by Commute KL. Uh, but I think uh, you know there's there's a lot of um, focuses with the bicycle, for example, recreational cycling, uh, cycling for health and things like that. But I really uh, started by Commute KL uh, out of my uh, concern about the climate. Uh, I even, I think I quit my architectural job, right? I, I quite, um, it was quite a, tough, quite a tough decision because my previous architectural job, full-time architectural job at a firm, right, was quite, um, uh, you know, the, you had some good jobs. Then after that, I made the con conscious decision to leave, but I think that was around uh, the time when Australia had, had, had the bushfires. It was all around the news, and and uh, yeah, I wanted to do. I wanted some time, right? Uh, somehow to address or figure out how to address uh, uh, issues like climate issues. Um, you know, somehow, um, somehow. I think learning about it also because I was a full time architect, and it's like nine to six o'clock, right? And of course, there's overtime also just doing uh, architectural work. But I wanted to sort of see how i could have one foot in um in in uh, somehow climate related stuff and at the time i was interested in permaculture and all that but uh but during the second phase of the pandemic i started um site commute kl uh just it was just a social media thing mm. uh just started <laughs> an instagram and uh posting uh posting just uh I think uh, a bit of stuff on like urban planning, uh, urban planning, uh, the benefits of like the bicycle, um, uh, how how the bicycle can sort of uh, address the climate, uh, urban planning, uh, safety, health, and and so on uh, Even uh, yeah So it started with social media. And, um, but I did want it to become physical, you know, do something physically somehow. Uh, and of, of course, um, uh, yeah, like at, the time, at the time I was figuring, how, figuring out how to do that. But eventually, like now, mo uh, more recently, we started a bike kitchen at uh, Tamantun. Uh, so what a bike kitchen is, is uh, we are just, um, what a bike kitchen is is uh, so typically a bike kitchen is not uncommon overseas. Uh, so or actually in KL also there's a bike kitchen KL also. Uh, but what basically what a bike kitchen is uh, is a place right there. They uh, collect old bicycles and after that they refurbish the bicycle. Sorry, they teach 
uh, people mm. who are interested to get a bicycle. Yeah, right. we teach people how to fix a bicycle. Then possibly you get the bicycle for free, and um, with a donation, of course. Then after that, um, then after that, if you have your own bicycle, and after that, if you um, if you uh, if there's any problems with your bicycle, we teach you how to fix your own bicycle. So I was in few bicycle kitchens in uh, Sydney when I was studying in Sydney. Sorry, when I was working in Sydney, uh, I, I volunteered at two bicycle kitchens, and I think it's just a split. This is just a space to sort of spread the knowledge about bicycles, about wayfinding, about uh, what else? Yeah, things like that, lah. It's just a space mm-hmm. for that. Okay. But I think with our bike kitchen in in PPDI, right? We are also conveying a uh, few things, also like climate. And uh, and I think integrating it with public transport and things like that, lah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um. Uh, ba- based on my understanding, right, Justin is, uh, I think you created Bike Commute KL with a large goal or objective. The big the big picture is of course to tackle um, <laughs> climate change, but what I'm very curious to know um is your relationship with cycling. Because I know there's multiple ways you can tackle climate change and uh, reduce your uh, waste and consumption. But I was quite curious to know how did you even start cycling? Like what was your relationship with cycling uh, be- before it became like this whole serious movement, right? Like I want to revisit maybe child Justin. Um, was cycling something very unique or special for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely, and it's also a question that I ask. Uh, so I, I've done done a few talks. I'm also very interested in how how other people start cycling, also because I feel like I was very lucky, uh, and uh, what is this? Lucky and it's a unique scenario, right? That how to to how I picked up cycling. So I did cycle. I did learn how to cycle when I was form two, not not when I was a kid. Uh, so mm. I mountain bike at, at uh. Bukit Kiara, but I only started commuting when I went overseas uh, to study. So I went to uh, Newcastle, Australia to study. And when, of course, we have, with most people, right, when they go overseas, you don't bring your car with you. Yeah, you uh, you have to make use of the public transport there. And um, and I, I, I guess uh, you sort of learn, um, yeah, how to navigate around the city or your town, right? where you are studying at with whatever you have there like, without the car. So uh, I was at, at the town where I was studying at, right, it's not um, it's it's not in a city, like, it's more of like uh, similar to people, that sort of thing. And uh, I think the more feasible way to get around uh, from my house to the university, which is neither near, neither too near, neither too far, right, was a bicycle. Mm. Uh, so I got like a... <laughs> And I got it from a bike kitchen at the university also. I got a second-hand bicycle uh, for a very cheap price um, because they were encouraging people to cycle. So I got a, uh, a very old second-hand road bike. Um, and from there, right, I started to cycle everywhere. And, um, and because in Australia also, you get to bring the bicycles on the train. And I I brought the bike my bicycle to the to, like for example from Ipoh to KL la. So in Australia it's a Newcastle to Sydney, uh. So I went everywhere with the bicycle, and I even did grocery shopping with the bicycle, uh. Because that's the only way um I could, uh I could do it la, as a student yeah. Mm. Um, so but coming back to Malaysia. Uh, just like everyone else, right? I thought it was impossible to cycle around. It's like impossible to get to work. Uh, and and once again, and once again, I conformed back to uh, uh, driving for like I think five years. Mm. Uh, so I didn't thought that that it was a way. Uh, but yeah, after, <laughs> um, but uh. I think after a while, I figured out that I could cycle to a nearby train station. So I used the bicycle as a first mount solution um, to the train station. I took the train to Bangsa at where I work, to Bangsa station at where I work. So um, there was a time when, yeah, uh, 
So after a while, I sort of picked up the bicycle again uh, as a for, as a means to commute. Mm. Then I think recently I just got more serious with it. Uh, I I sort of made a rule. Um, it's sort of like a test. Uh, a test and also to see how feasible or how difficult it is or how easy it is uh, to live without a car. So now I live a car-free life. Um, and, and yeah, uh, try and do everything as much as I can with, uh, with the bicycle. Uh, mm. Yeah. Johnson, you look like you had something to to say. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so I mean, I I I understand that the the overarching um, goal is to, um, I suppose, in some degree, tackle climate change, which is this huge animal, right? Uh, and we've heard what what you do from um, the social media side of things and the the bike kitchen, uh, and and how you got into this. I'm curious, like you know, from from like a. Um, like, how do you come to decide that, okay, if I want to tackle social change, eh, sorry, climate change, I'm going to start with the bicycle, you know? How, how did that decision-making uh, process or that thinking process happen? Uh, I guess because, um, yeah, I think because I have, like, quite a lot of interest in the bicycle, I guess, uh, I, I think with my time overseas for a few years and also volunteering. So I, I volunteered at two bicycle kitchens when I was uh, when I was in Sydney, when I was working in Sydney for two years. Yeah. Uh, so I learned like a lot of my bicycle mechanics there. I, I sort of uh, got to know the community. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, then I, I think I, I, I think uh, unlike, I, I think that I, I think maybe I realized right that uh, compared to many other people I I know, uh, mm. not yeah maybe not many people uh, uh, yeah is uh, that 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 much of a, that they have that much interest in the bicycle and I, sorry I think with climate change also with bicycles right it's maybe not something that is uh, being addressed yep. being addressed a lot. Um, so I think, uh, <laughs> with this also, um, so it, not just the bicycle, but I'm also interested, interested in, uh, uh, tackling the topic of car dependency also. Mm -mm. <laughs> so <laughs> with climate change, right, there's a lot of, I think activists, there are many activists that covered, uh, about race, yeah? about waste, about deforestation, um, what else, about energy. Many people also tackle about, uh, you know, oil also. They, they, they sort of, uh, they sort of like uh, target oil companies and things like that. We hear that a lot in news, like mm. uh, Exxon Mobile, Shell and all that. But uh, I think not many people, um, yeah, talk about cars being a problem in Malaysia, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not it's not something that you hear a lot and not, not many people talk about the bicycle being a solution. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is something okay. that it's been uh, talked a lot about in um, <laughs> in Europe, for example, but not a lot in Malaysia. So I hope to start that con <laughs> conversation in um, <laughs> in Malaysia. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think it may, may be a good time to kind of go into, you know, why not, you know, what are some of the challenges that you face in, in, in Malaysia? No, why not Malaysia, like, like you're asking. But before we go into that, I was curious, so you mentioned that you now live a, a car-free life. Uh, and I'm curious to know, how is that like in, in Malaysia, you know? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, so... I think so far it's been okay. There are some challenges, but I think for other people, like uh, when they see me do it, like they would think it's a challenge la, if they were to start doing it. But I think I have a lot of experience with the bicycle. Uh, I, I also have done cycle touring actually. So I what cycle touring is, I, I sort of cycled like, uh, uh, from Thailand to, uh, Thailand to Laos to Vietnam to Cambodia, that sort of thing. So I, I think I have a lot of experience on the road. Uh, so I'm able, 
yeah, so I'm, I think I'm able to sort of tackle our traffic and all that. So, uh, so how, so, sorry, how is it like? I think there's, there's obviously challenges uh, compared to cycling overseas. Uh, for example, I live in PJ, and I think PJ is known for uh, having a lot of highways, yeah? So where I live is, I, I live in like Damansara Jaya, so it's like a suburban island also, and it's surrounded by highways. And I think you have to carefully cross the highways and things like that to, for example, get to the train station. Uh, there, is, there is this urban disconnect, right, that is caused by highways. Um, but I'm also very inspired by people, lo by uh, local people over here. But I, I do see mostly, um, what do you call this, uh, uh, like, like foreign, uh, foreign workers who are cycling, who, you know, who, don't own a car they don't own a motorbike but they also once again depend on the bicycle in malaysia right and the way they live their life right how they have to cross highways how, how they have to cross the roads and all this kind of stuff so um yeah it, it is a challenge but it's not impossible and uh, i i think uh using public transport uh so i have two sort of bike two kinds of bicycles i have a full-size bike i have a folding bike uh so I can bring my folding bike onto the train, but uh, once again, it has a limited time where they allow you to allow folding bikes on the train. But with that also, there's another, there's another solution to that. Uh, you, you have to wrap the bike, my, my folding bike. If it's on peak hour, I have to wrap the folding bike in the back so that it looks like luggage. That, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of techniques to sort of uh, get around coffee, coffee. Uh, I think the other big challenge is also, um, uh, yeah, to be honest, right, pollution. Yeah, pollution is a big thing which I now sense a lot more. I, I know that if, I, I know the, I know the, you know, I can feel the emissions coming out from cars, which, you know, we are sort of desensitized, right, if you are driving every day. Um, if you are driving every day in the aircon, right, we sort of, don't sort of sense the pollution, but it actually causes causes a lot of pollution uh, right. yeah so these are some of the challenges and uh, maybe bicycle parking also sorry bicycle parking is a <laughs> challenge if you go to places like pavilion uh, I I'm actually I have no not a lot of problems with parking my bicycle because I always there's a sign signpost uh, or a street lamp or something like that right where I can park my bicycle at uh, so I'm usually okay but when you go to places like Pavilion or Lalaport or something like that, right? All these high class places. And if you park your bicycle there or you, even you're there with your bicycle, right? The security guard will come and they'll shoo you away. Uh, because I, I don't know why, maybe the image of, yeah. of bicycles and all this kind of stuff is like know, low class or something. Maybe it's dirty, <laughs> that's why. They're worried you yeah, yeah. bring uh, dirt in and whatnot, perhaps. Um, yeah. But but just yeah. hear, hearing what you've shared so far, I've actually so many questions. I <laughs> hope you don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it brought me back to I think a couple of weeks ago when I had a conversation with some friends about um, going somewhere, meeting somewhere. <laughs> but I think I say something like, you know, hey, I'll cycle there, um, and it was actually very baffling for uh, my friends who heard what I what I what I said. And I myself, I don't consider myself a cyclist. I think I I only cycle when I can. Uh, or when I feel like it, I'm definitely not a car-free um, guy, so to speak. But what 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 um, let what conversation uh, what sparked our conversation was because I mentioned that hey, I'm cycling um, there today, and I think the perspective that I gained is that you know Malaysia maybe at present time is not the most inclusive. So I think like in LRT stations, you have um, a lift for uh, OKU for the disabled or basically wheelchair, even for elderly to go up and down. I think there's also towels and the buttons on each lift are also um, they're inclusive for people who are blind. They're also able to use it. Um, but perhaps like, like you mentioned earlier, so with parking, with bringing bicycles in and out, I think it's a very... Um, rare occasion so rare that when you say you're cycling somewhere people are often shocked and uh, what continued in that conversation is 
uh, one of my friends said in Malaysia no one's gonna cycle around you know it's too dangerous it's too hot the weather is also very unpredictable so it sounds like you have a very um, uphill battle you know um, on, on your plate right now but when I heard what my friend said I said to him don't you think your assumptions on why people aren't cycling are also the reason why people don't want to cycle so it's a little bit of a chicken egg dilemma where it, Malaysia in present time is not safe enough maybe for cyclists to you know show themselves but at the same time because they don't show themselves people think that there are no need for cyclists or people don't see like uh, foreigners using bicycles as their main modes of transportation or even day-to-day -day commuters like now yourself or maybe some of your friends um, so do you think that that perspective is fair like you know there's no need for it so people don't look to it but because people don't look to it then people don't want to do it as well uh, well, okay let me see how I answer this but yeah it, it's it's um i mean it is fair enough and it, it is a problem that i'm also thinking about every day on how to sort of talk about it also uh because yes, it, it is, uh, I, I do understand people's concern and I, I do bring few beginners out to cycle also. And as I'm doing it, right, I don't, um, and I, thinking about them also, um, thinking about them also, I am concerned how they would tackle certain situations on the road. Mm. Yeah, there is, uh, there is a big concern about safety, uh, about people, about, especially if people are new to the bicycle, right, they are confident cycling on the road. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So their skill level uh, on how they would tackle certain uh, road conditions also. So thinking about that, right? It's it's not. Uh, <coughs> yeah, like, it's not easy. Um, and and yeah. So I guess I I it is a chicken and egg situation, uh, but. I think it's like targeting several demographics. Like I think, for example, okay, for, for example, I, I think, um, I think like roads need to be more inclusive, right? Uh, roads need to be more inclusive that there's space for not just bicycles, but pedestrians to sort of cross the road or to walk next to the highway or to have a you know a pavement that's not broken right that would encourage people to cycle or walk there safely and um and and it's and the the experience to sort of use that pavement or whatsoever right is mm. um it's, it's good so you encourage people to sort of use it yeah so there's an urban planning side to it also and that would encourage a greater demographic right a demographic that is not so um that's not so skilled with the bicycle you know to sort of be confident enough to use it and we do have some of these bike lanes in uh, kl but it's not uh, perfect mm. uh but at the same time once again it's a chicken and egg thing la, like you said so i am kl uh dbkl just plan to uh, create more bike lanes um but is it at a pace that is fast enough is it and and also bike lanes only work right if they are connected you know you can have a bike lane mm. you can have a bike lane somewhere right but if it's not fully connected to the greater network right uh it may not be fully used uh at the moment also there's, there's this perception that the bike lane KL that it's, it's not used a lot uh there's a lot of things la. uh but but yeah so i think with the bike kitchen also i'm trying to I, I, the end goal of the bike kitchen is to create this presence right of people gathering to sort of fix bicycles, talk about bicycles, talk about the climate, talk about the bicycle as a first or last mile transportation, right? And I think share this with, because I, I did have some meetings with DBKL also, share these images to DBKL and show that there's an interest, you know, in, in cycling and to uh, create this awareness also, because I think on the, on the infrastructural side also, you can create all these uh, bicycle lanes, right? But there is a knowledge gap on uh, how to how to use it uh, how to encourage people to use it also um but i think with the current conditions also i think people with uh, there is a big group of people who cycle uh, recreationally 
They mm. cycle on the weekends. They are. Uh, they can also tackle like uh, you know crazy situations on the road also. And I think these people, uh, this group of people, right, who are already uh, confident with cycling, right, can sort of try to attempt to cycle at work, lah. Yeah, uh, because I think, yeah, a lot of these people, right, they cycle in the weekend. Uh, they have uh, they they are physically okay. They are physically able to do it, uh, but they don't cycle to work because uh, maybe. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure mm. the reasons uh, from them, but I I think uh, I could guess lah. It's probably the disconnect. It's far far away, or sweating and things like that lah. Uh, but talking about heat, right? Uh, for me, I I so far have been able. I've been okay with the heat over here because if I leave for if my work starts at nine a.m. right, and if I have to leave work at eight thirty a.m., so I just breeze cycle to the train station, and um. I don't sweat a lot, and at, sorry, eight a.m. The sun doesn't really come out, doesn't really come up yet, so it's still okay, lah. And when you finish work, uh, when you finish work, um, uh, what was this? Uh, when you finish work, uh, yeah, it's also like six o'clock in right. the evening, and the sun is sort of down again. Uh, so this is talking about commuting, you know. And even if you can't commute to work, I think um, I like I like to promote this idea of the fifteen minute city. Being aware about your fifteen minute neighborhood also. Uh, so where where you where you're living at, the be aware about the amenities that you have around, like your mm. supermarket, grocery shopping, uh, your clinic, and things like that. And maybe from there, right, you could cut down your car usage, right? Maybe mm. use a bicycle or walk. To these places to get your food, yeah. yeah. yeah I think car yeah. reliance has been, um, <clears throat> Lucy speaking. I think it has been overlooked in many ways. Uh. Johnson, when was the last time you cycled a bike? Not for <laughs> sports, not for leisure, but you know to get somewhere to commute. <laughs> yeah. I I don't even remember. Do you? I don't even remember to be honest. Do you have a bike yeah. actually? I don't have a bike. Okay, I yeah. I think. Uh, the reason why I ask this is because, like, um, personally for me, I do try and cycle out to um, at least take away food, to tap out food if it's near enough. Um, but I happen to own a bike. I am privileged enough to own a bike, you know. But I know that not everyone um, owns one. I think my inclination is that people own more cars than they do bikes. So... <laughs> A question that I would want to pose to you, Justin, is I noticed that commercial bike shops, um, at least the mainstream bike shops lately or in the past maybe three, four, five years, especially throughout the pandemic, right? The bicycles that they sell um, are more geared towards like mountain biking, road biking, uh, cross-country biking, and I think like nine out of ten of them will not have a basket, or or a what is that thing? The back a back seat, right? For you to put like things. So I'm thinking like practically speaking, if Johnson were to go out to a bike shop right after this session, hey, I want to buy a bicycle. I want to go use this as my daily mode of transport. Um, is there a universe where that that kind of bike exists where you can actually purchase one? You know, that's that will fit this purpose of yeah. not sports, not it's leisure, actually. Suited for commuting, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good question. Actually, never never had that question before. And yeah, I did. I do notice that you know, if you go to most bike stores like PSH, Pedal Sport, and all that, yeah. So <laughs> some like fancy ten k and mm. uh, ten thousand ringgit mountain or road bikes, uh, uh, but yeah, they, they are some. I, I noticed that Decathlon sells commuting bicycles, the, the Dutch sort of bicycles that mm. have all that, love, but it's quite um, it could be heavy. I'm not sure. I have never tested it out. Um, I never tested it out. And mm. the bicycles that I have, right, are all, are all these secondhand bikes that I got from the bike kitchen, or I got secondhand when I was overseas. Mm. Uh, so I, I do like secondhand bicycles. I like old bicycles. Uh, so that's where I get it. But once again, you do need some skills 
to sort of uh, you do need some experience to I which bicycle to get and to sort of fix the bicycle if there's any problems because uh, bicycles they are quite okay to they can last quite long and after that you can fix most most problems on the bicycle mm. uh but yeah where, where to get as a new person right where to get a bicycle i think maybe decathlon but i never tested their bicycles before right. uh, free marketing uh, for decathlon right now if anyone of you works for decathlon <laughs> who are watching uh yeah yes, <laughs> i i i like i think folding bikes is also popular mm. uh especially you are this this um there's a bigger time right there's a bigger period where you can bring it on the train because full-size bikes you can only bring it on the train on the weekends uh but like a folding bike i don't know i might recommend a dahon b6 that sort of thing which you can get off coffee um uh cost like 1200 ringgit uh, the last time i checked lah. Mm. Uh, so yeah sorry because a lot of people ask me also what what bike to get and things like that maybe mm. i would recommend a dahon b6 uh, uh how about um you know in a bike kitchens right if someone were to come to a bike kitchen expecting to fix a bike and also leave with a bike, um, I know it's, it's on a donation basis, uh, but you know, on average, how much would they expect to, to, to donate in order to get a, a bike? Uh, uh, sorry, so at the moment, my bike kitchen, our bike kitchen, right, it's just a pondo and we don't have a, we don't collect old bikes at the moment because we don't have the space and also the resources to do that. Uh, right. So yeah, we don't collect and, and sort of give away old bikes. So that's, that's in Australia. Um, mm. But I think if people, I think another good option is if people, they find a secondhand bike on online, like Bicycle Buy Sell or Carousel or uh, Facebook, right? They could bring it to the bike kitchen and we can look at it and see how we can help you to fix it. Uh, uh, that, that sort of thing. Lah. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, I, I think looking at how the uh, the foreign workers, right, the bicycles that they use over here, yep. they, are all, um, they are all these very old, cheap uh, mountain bikes, actually. But they, they use it every day and i think so i interviewed them also so they do have their own community where they pass down maybe uh like a bicycle from one person to another person that sort of thing from what i heard and they all know how to fix the bicycles themselves hmm. um but yeah like uh, all cheap bicycle is is okay um because i think if you have an expensive bicycle also many people are concerned about safety if you lock a ten thousand ringgit bicycle or five thousand or one thousand ringgit bicycle, that sort of thing, like at a station, uh, that sort of thing, you you want to use a better, a very good lock, or yeah, yeah. Most people are concerned about safety that your bike will get stolen, so mm -hmm. it's not a bad idea to use a cheaper bicycle for commuting, lah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, sounds like there's actually a lot uh, that we can talk about. Uh, I I yeah. I noticed earlier when you were sharing, you mentioned about having meetings with DBKL and and, and whatnot, right? So obviously, okay, we 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 we're, we're epic, and I think it's quite familiar for us as well that change is not overnight. You know, um, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort as well, and I can't help to think that you know with what you're tackling right now. You do need, I feel, not only the public's <laughs> opinion, but also the trust of change makers and place makers who can actually have a much bigger influence. Um, perhaps within their town planning, they can be more inclusive and slowly introduce um, cycling in um, various spots throughout Klang Valley, perhaps. Um, as of today, are you working with any... Um, perhaps council, town councilmen or placemakers to implement these changes so that you could also see 
more people start cycling and etc. Only if you can share, of course. Yeah, uh, I guess quite loosely. Um, uh, so, uh, I think I should acknowledge also that uh, previously Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey, yeah. he, he did the Jeff, yeah. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, hey, 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 suddenly, suddenly I'm confused. Uh, but, but he worked on the bicycle uh, map project and he worked quite uh, closely. Jeffrey. With, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, uh, but I I sort of came to this bike bike conversation this bike scene a bit late lah so I mm. I'm sort of okay so anyways with um I think with DBKL at the moment is just to get them to sort of uh, support our bike kitchen we hope to get uh I think with some of the members that we have in our group right they they have sort of experience tackling uh, with DBKL and things like that lah. So at the moment, we are just hoping for them to endorse our bike kitchen at the DBI. But uh, yeah, just to get them to notice us. But, um, mm. but I think uh, like in the future also, I, uh, sorry, I have been in, in, involved in one discussion with them also about the Wangsa Maju about the Wangsa Maju uh, blueprint, right? Because we do tend to do a sustainable city uh, planning thing over there, and we do opinions from stakeholders. Um, and I was invited by Bike with Elena to sort of attend that. So I think um, with DBKL and all that, and even UTM, right, who, who does some of their blueprints, uh, we need some of their opinion, uh, our opinions also because many of them don't cycle. They may be town planners and things like that, right? But many of them don't cycle, or a lot of them, of course, like, like many Malaysians, right? We are from a car centric uh, mindset. Mm. You know, we have biases towards the cars, car, and things like that, right? Mm -mm. And we, we do say that we want to be more sustainable. Uh, we want to introduce car bicycle lanes and all these sort of things, right? But I don't think many of them are cyclists. So I think our opinion would be useful also. La. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the other thing that um, like Comic KL is doing also is this, um, uh, I think what we call it is this, uh, I think what we call it, but basically, right, we, we, yeah, because my background is architecture, Yasmin is urban planning, so many of us are architects, right, we have a background in design. So we, you know, we like to reimagine the city. So sometimes we create some graphics and things like that to sort of, um, you know, show that it's a bicycle lane over here or how, how it's like, a, how a street is like car free, you know, how a street could be like car free, car free. Um, and if it's a car free street, right, then you got, you can introduce in more trees. So I did one image, right, where, uh, what if KL was car free by 2030 something lah. Yeah, mm. it's a quite a tight timeline, right? Because I'm mm. thinking about you know, there's a climate emergency and things like that. You know, maybe Malaysians should be should be acting like we are an emergency, yeah. And you know, what if KL was car free by 2035, right? So I did did a visualization, Photoshop, and things like that. So planted more trees. You know, I in the in the background, right? There's even um, there's even a, a billboard like a you know, it's a digital billboard, right, which usually advertises, you know, things, you know, like things to buy or things to what. But instead, like informing people about the, what, what the temperature is, what is the air quality index, what is the land surface temperature. And I, I speculated that, you know, with a car-free street, right, you have a better, you have better air and better uh, all that, lah, with more trees and less cars, more pedestrians walking around. And um, you know, then you can get to your public transport easily mm. without needing cross uh, highways and things like that, lah. Mm. What's the question again? Lah? Oh, but but so yeah, the end goal. But the end goal for the bike kitchen, the end goal of, for bike commute KL, right? Uh, you know, they we are doing all sorts of things, but the end goal is really to um, is really to sort of encourage decision makers, right, to implement. 
to implement like I, I don't know uh, like cycling lanes or what sort of sustainable transportation uh, in a good way like best as possible you know MRT stations to be better connected uh, to have a bicycle parking and things like that like, although we haven't we haven't gone there yet like some of these things is is not 100% yet um, but yeah that's what we hope to do yeah yeah mm. to create that awareness yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm wondering like um you, you know because you, you mentioned that your background is architecture and we're talking about urban it involves urban design as well uh and, and we can't deny that you know for the past few decades uh the development plan of of malaysia for cities and stuff is definitely centered around motorized vehicles you know, and, and so, so much uh, money and time and effort has already been invested to, to create all this infrastructure. Lah. You know, how, how, do you, how do you imagine this? Uh, how do you imagine change happening? You know, so with the work that we're doing now, we're realizing, okay, you know, um, we need to be more pedestrian friendly. We need to be uh, more cycling friendly. You know, but how, how, do you, how would you imagine like the work that you do uh, affecting uh, change with, with uh, I suppose, the decision makers? And how do you imagine them, um, I, I suppose, adapting, you know, whatever that's already been done uh, towards a more uh, sustainable future? Um, uh, it's, um, how do, I don't know, maybe now I don't have a very high expectations. Maybe I can imagine something happening, right? But I don't know if it's realistic or not. You know, uh, if it's overly wishful or things like that. So I, I do have like one side of me that is like, um, it's like trying to think realistically mm. and not uh, over expect, uh, expect too much and things like that. Mm. What do I expect? To, right? Okay. I, I think it's I think it's learning. Uh, it's it's really for me as especially as the person who's who's um, you know. I, I, so I'm learning a lot. I think impo most important thing, uh, most importantly, is um, I'm learning a lot. I'm meeting new people all the time, right? Uh, who's giving suggestions and you know pointing where I should uh, where I should go, who I should meet, and things like that, right? So I think I'm learning a lot uh, mm. as I go. Yeah, yeah. La, uh, I think learning lot, but I I'm very inspired by how. Um, <laughs> uh, I think a good uh, reference for me was how uh, Amsterdam right became mm. a cycling city because yeah. Amsterdam uh, I think after the world war right uh, after the second world war they were also going towards a car centric direction also uh, uh, as well as the many parts of the world yeah after the uh, after the industrial age right uh, I think I think planners uh, started to embrace the machine, uh, and after that, planned cities around cars. Uh, and, and and the Netherlands, right, was a place that sort of embraced that also, and they sort of knocked down neighborhoods, and and um, things like that to make way for highways and make way for uh, larger roads. So, um, uh. So yeah, I, I think what was inspiring was I always thought that Amsterdam was a cycling city. La. I thought the Netherlands, Europe and all these Copenhagen, all these countries right, were a cycling city, but they were actually car centric also. So I think what got them to change was um, was I think the public's awareness about uh, how, how it was destroying their cities, how it was destroying their environment. And I think most importantly, there was this movement, right, uh, Stop the Kingdom Mod which was uh, stop the child murders uh, because I think at that time there were a lot of car accidents and a lot of children started to die uh, from car accidents. I think mm. 400, 400 something children died at 19, oh, sorry, I don't know the year. Uh, but at that time there was like this public outrage. Their parents were protesting against cars. So there was huge protests, right? And at the same time, uh, I think an important thing also there was um, there was the uh, oil crisis also. I think at that time, the oil prices sort of went up 
and I think politicians saw a hurt and they saw a change the planning of their the, the transport policy in their cities. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was an inspiring story. So how is that over here? I, I don't know. Uh so okay, I think um BBKL does have some plans, for example. They have a cycling pedestrian master plan. 19 sorry, 2000 Sorry, I've forgotten the year. Like, they, they said 2000, some, 2000 something to 2035 or something like that. But they do have um, a plan, right? Uh, they have done some surveys like who, who is keen on cycling, who is not keen on cycling, and how do you increase this percentage? So it has to do with um, uh, making use of incentives, uh, of course, intru introducing you know infrastructure and things like that. And... Uh, uh, and then there's this carrot and stick thing last. So you, you know you, you sort of lure the people to to uh, use public transport. Uh, you know you, you make it cheaper and things like that. Then after that, if they don't use it, you know you start to use do fines or something like that. You start to impose like uh, higher costs for coming into the city, something like that. Uh, so yeah. But that's a plan, lah. But we'll see how that's implemented. Mm. And I think like movements like like bike commute there and things like that is here to sort of uh, create that awareness on a social level, lah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was a very tough question that you posed um, to Justin Johnson. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm curious to know um, yeah. on a more personal scale, right, Justin, like. Um, what what do your friends, family, and perhaps your co-workers or even your boss think about what you're doing? Because it does sound like it takes a lot um, of time and effort with what you're doing, right? Has that affect your relationships perhaps or improve even <laughs> the relationships around you like um, on a more personal level? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, I just show up at so, for example, at work, at uni, I just show up at work with the bicycle and I think people are more like intrigued or impressed uh -huh. by how by how you can cycle to work, especially at UCSI in Chiras, right? Uh, my university is at a location where no one would have thought of, they have thought it's accessible by public transport. Yeah, because um, there is like a, several highways like that that's all sort of, you know cuts cuts the university away from the from the MRT station, but it is within a two km radius. Mm -mm. Uh, but um, yeah, I think people at work they are just you know they are just intrigued and things like that. Uh, Do people uh, feel bad for driving cars around you? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't ask them. <laughs> okay. uh, I didn't really ask them, but I. So I, I, I don't so I don't know many people that commute. Actually it's really just a handful to be honest. Mm. Yeah, so I do imagine friends and all that, right? Uh, not imagine. yeah, like, I have a lot of friends who still drive but I don't uh you know, I'm totally fine with it. Yeah. You, it's know? Like, you do your uh, thing, we do our thing, kinda Yeah, yeah, because I do understand that it's it it's not so easy also, but I think I, I'm just there to sort of like uh I know. I, I mean, at least there's a guy who's doing it, lah. Maybe, yeah. Mm. There's a guy who's doing it, and people see, and maybe they see that it's possible to actually do it. Mm. And I think, yeah, lah. I think that's, mm. that's about it. But uh, what else do people think? How about your family? <laughs> yeah. I think they are okay. Yeah, they are. They are sort of like used to it already. I think so. I don't really know what they, what their opinions. Mm. Ah, mm. Yeah. not mm. really strong opinions lah. I don't think it's strong opinions. Yeah, yeah. you, you strike me as that, okay. you strike me as a person who's uh quite free spirited, and probably this is already known in your family that you you like to do what you like to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I think I've done a few more more dangerous things lah. Like I, you know, cycle touring to uh, uh Indo China and things like that. Yeah. yeah, that one, that one, my family was concerned. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. you set the bar very high. So yeah. all this seems like good consolation for them. 
Yeah, <laughs> I, I think many people do question about oh, is it um, when I go to different shops and things like that, if they see me bring a folding bicycle, they say oh, is it safe to cycle on the road and things like that. Mm. Um, but I, I think it depends on how experienced you are cycling. Um, and I think for people who are starting, who you know, who who think that um, who think it's not possible, or, uh, or I don't know, you know, if they are interested to cycle on the road and they think it's uh, you know a safety problem, right? I I think it's yeah, it's about building your confidence or trying to build your skills. Uh, so I think recreational cycling maybe is a good way to sort of start lah, uh, cycling to your. Uh, closest shops and things like that, lah. And if you guys have any questions, you know you can always come to the bike kitchen to sort of ask us. Mm. And, and that's what the bike kitchen is about. Also, you have bike shops, which is a space that sells bicycles, but there's not really a space to talk about the problems or the knowledge, what whatever, um, you know, all this kind of stuff that that comes with cycling. Yeah. Uh, do bear in mind that people in the Netherlands and Copenhagen, they they start cycling. Around the city from a very young age, from eight years old. So um, I think a lot of people here, if they were to start, especially in our conditions, right? Uh, fair enough, it's not as easy, lah. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I mean, I so I, I I'm thinking like, you know, this is this is a long battle, right? You know that that yeah. you are that you are starting or a long. It's a long journey, lah. To, to get to perhaps where Netherlands is, where Copenhagen is, and, and whatnot, and I'm wondering, like you know, aside from and and I think that the example that you set, while it's great, is also a very high bar, you know, for people yeah. to immediately like abandon all cars and live a car-free lifestyle. It may be quite a stretch for most people, like. You know, what would you say uh, to people who who want to support this cause, right, uh, but cannot go to the to the extreme that you're at right now, you know, if, if you don't mind me okay. <laughs> phrasing it that way, like, what what are some of maybe the easy steps that they can they can take, you know, to yeah. to start their journey to to be where you are? Like? Yes, I, well, that's a good question. I think uh, it, there are a few things. For example, I think on if you are in, interested in climate, right? Uh, um, I think get to know. About, Get to know the advantages about cycling because many people they don't know about the advantages of cycling and if they see a cycling a cyclist on the road right uh, especially it's quite com quite common like and you can see it in like uh, comments in Facebook I like to sort of see comments in social media right sort of see what uh, the social um, opinions about people generally la. but yeah they face like a lot of stigma towards cyclists you know on the road so I, I think get to know the advantages of cycling you know uh, on the or yeah just get 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 informed yeah for example cars right is cars according to the DBTL climate action plan right cars are the highest emitter of emissions in KL yeah and I know many people who are interested in climate, right? They they do they go like very far lengths, right? For example, to sort of uh, I don't know to tackle waste, yeah, to tackle to tackle mm. uh, the issue of deforestation, Kuala Langa, and things like that. There's a lot of activism there, um, but not a lot goes into cars, yeah. So I think getting that awareness, right, that the highest emitter, right, is actually from our the way we get around private. Private vehicles, yeah, uh, specifically private private vehicles are highest. Rail only takes up about zero point six, you know, so it's not a lot. Um, it's even to my surprise, right? It's higher than uh, stationary energy, which is our electricity. Uh, it's higher than yeah, stationary energy, which is powered by coal. You know, uh, forty percent of our stationary energy is powered by coal, and it's even higher than that. You know, collectively, we have a big impact. So uh okay so that's one getting to know about getting a aware about uh, the benefits of cycling it's not just the uh, climate but in terms of mm -hmm. health yeah in terms of health is uh it's it's good for your health and in terms of economy also it saves uh I think the government can save a lot a lot on healthcare yeah 
I think, I think, it, in terms of economical sense, also, I think the car you, you, Malaysians spend a lot, of, lot, a lot of money on cars annually. Also, you spend a lot of money on roads and things like that. Mm. Uh, what else? Uh? And I think the fourth point is, you know, the livability of a city. Lah, like, yeah. If less cars we have, right? Because cars takes up a lot of real estate, and with less cars on the road, it, it makes way for a urban planning, right? That enables a more livable city. And uh, okay, sorry, that's what what other stuff, lah. Okay, yeah, maybe uh, highways. You know, so for example, I'm part of the Say No to PJD Link Highway Protest uh, Movement. And recently, also I created some images for for them, lah. Like. So I think get we become aware about highways, uh, highway construction in KL in the Klang Valley, right? Because I don't think we need any more new highways, to be honest. Uh, because it, it creates an induced demand for more cars to be on the road, yeah. Um, that means if you create more highways, it, it, it encourages more cars. You create more parking lots, it, encourage, it encourages more cars on the road. Mm. So, uh, for example, I'm part of Say No's BJD Link movement, right? And for example, the it's not as a sexy of a you know of a protest movement compared to like Kuala Lamet lah. So you know, uh, to be honest, right? Like the number of protests that we have online is like two thousand, uh, around two thousand something, right? uh that that sort of thing la you know that it's uh that like highway protest it doesn't get that much attraction so i think you know it can be part of the of being against like for example say no to bjd link or any new highways la. yeah mm. the size of the size of kl right like from one side of plank to ampang that sort of thing right is sort of the size between one side of singapore from the east side of singapore the west side of singapore yeah, if you overlay the Singapore island right onto KL, the Klang Valley right. So I mean, it's it's quite so you can compare that. You know, our Klang Valley we have a lot lot of highways. You know, uh, in that sense, to me, it's like very obscene uh, We saw went over the top with highways, mm. highway construction mm. in uh, in KL. So yeah, go against highways and uh. Uh, I think recycling lanes and I don't know somehow tell your our decision makers or something like that somehow. Mm. Uh, I don't don't know. Okay, yeah, have this be part of the conversation more on mm. for our future lah. I guess. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at the clock right now. Um, guys, it's 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 six. Um, I think maybe just allow me some time to map out for the rest of the session. So I feel like now is probably a, a decent <laughs> enough of an opportunity to do uh, maybe for myself and Johnson to share some of our takeaways before Johnson close the show. Um, for me, I think this has been quite insightful. First and foremost, just hearing what uh, Justin has to say on behalf of Bike Commute KL and also his personal um, values and beliefs. Um there's definitely a lot of conflicting thoughts that I have right now. Um, some we've already mentioned throughout the show. Um, but only if if you're asking me how I'm, what I feel towards this is that I do think it's a very tough and long um, battle ahead um, to see change slowly take shape in, in our country. I think if you ask most people um, if they had a choice or if they could i know they do have a choice but sometimes safety do you know the, the issue of safety do i think create a lot of fear and anxiety for most people who may actually want to go on cycle hey i i too want to be you know car free or like more car free than i am now um so perhaps some things that maybe we um can start doing is just i know the larger picture or the ultimate goal is for of course climate change and it not only has to come in the shape of a bicycle, uh, but you could also be a bit more inventive, be a bit more creative and um, just suggest carpooling as, as one way to reduce uh, the reliance of car and, and carbon emission. I think carpooling could be a great suggestion um, for those who may not be as comfortable um, cycling yet. 
But I think for those who are kind of like on the fence, you know, you have a bike, you're staring at it right now probably, I say give it a go. Uh, you may put yourself in a very uncomfortable spot, but I think that's where you really learn and grow and find out that, hey, this is, this is actually quite okay or hey, this is completely not okay and then like what can you do about it? Um, and perhaps lend support and join um, the movement that you've created with uh, Bike Commute KL. Um, yeah, but those are just my thoughts. I'm not sure about I'm not sure about you, Johnson. What What do you think? No, I I think I, I found this uh, most interesting uh, this this session um, because I, I think what we're looking at here or, or the example that I, I want our audience to to see here is is how you know it, it's really when we when we look at extraordinary people they they have a whole range of different interests or, or causes that they're working on. You know, and, and, and today we're hearing about something that, you know, may not be immediately obvious to, to most people, you know, like, like perhaps like uh, you know, poverty or like or homelessness or mm. uh, refugees. You know, th this is not one of the, the I, I guess, social issues that stand out. Um, but with that being said, it's not like this is any less important, you know, and, and it's, it's very encouraging to, to, to be able to, to know uh, that there are people, you know, at working at very various levels, you know, in 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 Klang Valley in Malaysia, um, and and trying to bring a spotlight on on these issues that should be highlighted as well. Um, I think um, what I took away from this is also how, you know, a lot of times the solutions that we we want to try to promote to the community, the causes that we stand for, also comes from our area of interest and and uh, and exposure. You know, just like how uh, Justin, you you had the privilege, I suppose, of being in uh, living in in countries abroad or visiting countries abroad, and, and it's amazing that you've taken those things that you've learned that you know will do uh, do our society better, and you're actually bringing that back to 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 Malaysia as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, you know, with that, we, I, I think. We, I acknowledge as well that um, I think change is a process, you know, and it requires people to, to, of course, be driven by their passions, but also it requires commitment and determination and humility, you know, and, and what I gathered from you is that you are in the, you're putting yourself actually in the field, um, not because you necessarily need, know all the, all the, all the answers, you know, but you're also figuring it out, um, while you're doing this, you're also learning about it on a micro and macro level, uh, and and you're sharing it with with people. You know, you're sharing your journey with people, and I think that itself um, is, is how change is done. You know, um, and and I, I think I I I think this lesson is especially important for people out there. You know, where people don't need to have all the answers to find the courage to even get started. You know, and I, I think you, you, you are a, a great role model, I think, in, in terms of that, you know, and, and I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your, um, your, your effort in, in, in trying to make this as clear to us as, as, as possible. Um, I think apart from that, then, you know, in order for us to kickstart our journey to, to uh, making our cities more livable, um, ensuring that our cities become more climate friendly, um, and I understand that people would just need to get more aware about how cycling and using bicycles um, can can really make a difference, you know. And and it's not just about your health and fitness, which is great, but there's so much more uh, to it as well. And and I I believe that um, many of these underlying benefits can also be found on on your Facebook page and your Instagram page as well which I hope people will, will come to and, and see for themselves. Yeah, so, so I think that's the, basically the takeaways that I get from, from this session, uh, Justin. Um, maybe before we end as well, could you tell everybody how they can connect with you and how they can uh, follow you, perhaps? And if you have any parting words for them. Hey, you're, you're muted right now, Justin. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm most active and um, most active on Instagram, I think. So our uh, Instagram is called at bikecommute.kl. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at uh, sorry, at bike commute no space. Dot kl at bike commute. Dot kl. Yeah. Mm. Uh, mm. so you can yeah, and if you search that on Facebook, also they there is a Facebook page, also. Mm. Uh, so yeah. Uh, we have an email also. It's bike commute. Dot kl at gmail. Dot com. And very soon we'll start. We'll have a website also, oh, And wow. I think um, sorry, our bike kitchen happens once every once every month on Sunday, the the fourth Sunday of the month, lah, uh, at Ramantun. So I think if you guys, you know, we can meet at um, we can meet at the bike kitchen also. Uh, if you have any problems with your bike. At the bike kitchen, we also share a few things about um, commuting. Also, not just about bicycles, um, about the train line and things like that. Also, lah. Uh, so at the moment, it's the fourth Sunday of every month, so you can come also physically. We are happy to meet new people there. Um, what else is coming up? What's the average yeah, attendance like- per per kitchen? Uh, at the moment, at the moment, I think it's around ten. Oh. But we, when we started, it was a lot more. Uh, mm. Because yeah, a lot of people were curious to what it was, and many people came. But now it's a bit lesser. But, but nonetheless, you know, we'll still be there every uh, every fourth Sunday of the month, lah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see if we'll make it more frequent or not. Mm. Uh, because potentially we might make it more frequent, we might have it in, in downtown KL also. Uh, in Tamantun, we may have it at different locations also because we are talking to BBKL and even MRT Corp potentially, right? And we might have our bike kitchens at different locations. But the best place to, you know, quickly chat with us is bike commute, uh, dot KL on Instagram. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any final few words for people who may be listening uh, at the moment? Um, <laughs> I think uh, you've said quite a lot. <laughs> I think you've said quite a lot already. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> cool. So guys, if, if you're listening, um, Please show some support to Bike Commute KL. Check out their Instagram page. Check out their Facebook page. Be on the lookout for their website. And maybe we can see how um, we can get involved and take part in this movement. Um, yep. Johnson, would you like to close the show? Yeah, thanks so much. I think once again, that is um, Justin. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for being such a role model of what an extraordinary person looks like or is like. Um, and I think to our audience out there, I hope I hope you got a good uh, snapshot uh, of what an extraordinary person looks like. And if you're wondering why Justin is so extra, I hope you got the <laughs> answers as well. Yeah, but if yeah. you if you too want to be extra, just remember that whether big or small. Uh, little or much, you no know, change begins with you. And uh, at the end of the day, I think what's important that if you want to be extraordinary, you just have to start. You just have to find the immediate needs around you. You have to look at the things that uh, you're passionate about and believe that the little that you do can inspire other people to do a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's all I the also, things. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to add that with. Yeah, I'm also very inspired by what Epic has done also because uh, I've sort of followed what Epic has done from like quite long time ago. And it's also been very inspiring how, uh, you know, change, ch- yeah, these change makers like yourself and how you all sort of do things and how you all started also. So, uh, yeah, so it's also inspired, very inspiring to me also. And I think... Uh, I think Epic was one of the reasons why I decided not to stay in Australia and came back to KL. <laughs> yeah, it, oh. it really is. It's it's because of Epic. Yeah, because I thought you know they see, I I I couldn't imagine just working in an office. You know, in Australia and and things like that. Um, from Monday to Friday, but 
in ethic, you know, coming back to KL, I sort of work my full time job in the weekends or maybe sometimes during the weekdays. Um, yeah, I, I sort of joined that design that, that design house thing with Epic, you know, and yeah. So the, it, Epic has been very inspiring also, and I guess I guess with why so why so extra, you know, we all sort of inspire each other mm. to you know. There are many change makers in KL. I saw sort of notice, you know, compared to uh, more developed countries. So I think yeah, mm. it's very grassroots thing lah. Like, yeah. Mm. Awesome, yeah. Do do recommend more change makers to us so that we can feature them on our show. Uh, but thanks for sharing that with us as well. That is uh, nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, we didn't. We yeah. We sometimes we tend to make uh, people's parents angry. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but good to know that we got a good uh, talented uh, individual to to stay back in our in our home <laughs> and and make a difference here. Okay. all right so yeah that that is it for episode one season two um i hope that all of you will join us for the coming episodes as well yeah all right see you thanks everybody thanks justin